Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in Europe. Good very early morning in the United States. This is Frederick Dickers from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and talking about to you about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. What's new? I have no disclosures to make in this presentation. Um, we all know that human papillomavirus is a small double-stranded DNA virus. It, um, the uh, types 6 and 11, HPV 6 and 11, they are the cause of recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. And it's number 6 and 11 out of some 120 HPV types and more than 200 subtypes. In the disorder, we rarely see malignant transformation. And of all these types, uh, you can see here in the left column, you can see the huge number of types. And for example, the upper one is the common warts, and that is caused by HPV type 2. And number 1, 2, 4, and 63, they cause plantar warts, like your children have when they go to the swimming pool. Uh, in the middle, you see the highest risk genital cancers, and they are caused by HPV 16, 18, 31, and 45. And at the lower line, the lowest line, you can see HPV 6 and 11, and they are the cause of uh, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. The lifetime probability for acquiring any HPV is probably closer to 100% than the 50% mentioned here. And in the larynx of healthy people, we see that it's prevalent in some 20% of persons. In laryngeal cancer patients, it's uh, very few people up to about the half. And in varicose carcinoma of the larynx, which really looks like a papilloma, there we see 45% of prevalence of the HPV in this varicose carcinoma. But even in recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, we just see 83 to 100% of uh, presence of this virus. So that means that not all RRP is caused by this virus. However, if there is no HPV present in the lesion, then there is a high relative risk of carcinoma. And that brings me to the relationship between HPV in the larynx and cancer. If you have HPV 6 and, and or 11, you have a very low risk of cancer. If you have 31 or 33, it's an intermediate risk. And if you have got HPV 16 and 18, it's a high risk for laryngeal carcinoma. The pathogenesis is that micro lesions of the epithelium, which, which occur, for example, after loud shouting or long talking, then we have these micro lesions and the HPV virus enters the stem cells through lesions on the surface and it, it goes down up to the stem cells. The virus induces immune regression and then we get cell division with of HPV DNA. The cells then migrate to the upper layers and the cells then produce virions which induce wart-like lesions and there we have the papilloma. So immunologically there is lack of effective immune response to the HPV probably and we see that the balance between the cell mediated and humoral Immuno, uh, immunologic response shifted to the humoral side. So that is at least not very normal. In Europe, we see two sorts of uh, RRP. We see the juvenile kind, the JORRP, and the adult kind. And the juvenile kind is exceedingly rare, 0.17 per 100,000 per year. By definition, it occurs when the patient is younger than 18 years and 75% even occurs before the eighth year. There's vertical transmission, meaning transmission from mother to child, and usually it's more severe than the adult type, 
leading to more tracheal cannulas and more disease burden. In the adult way, which is a little bit more common, but still half, uh, well, 0.5 per 100,000, so that's five per million per year. By definition, it occurs in patients older than 18 years. There's a male to female preponderance of two to one, and the contagiousness of the virus is unknown. I'll come back to it later. The course of the disease is that it's milder than the juvenile kind. However, this is the European way, and in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's completely different. In Europe, we see a trimodal distribution and uh, similar uh, graph, similar um, uh, calculations have been made in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa, and we just saw two peaks in uh, Southern Africa. We have, in Europe, we have three peaks. The first peak is at the second bar, which is five to 10 years old. Then we have a peak at 30 to 40 years of age, and we have a third peak occurring approximately at 60 years of age. So there's a trimodal distribution in Europe. In Africa, there's not, and in the United States, it looks like the third peak is not as apparent as it is in Europe but maybe it is there as well. We're not sure yet. The clinical presentation is dysphonia. It starts, it always starts with dysphonia. In Europe, children and adults then go to a doctor. In Sub-Saharan Africa, dysphonic children do not go to a doctor and they just go there when there's respiratory distress. Respiratory distress as a starting symptom in Europe is exceedingly rare. On presentation, subglottic and more distal spread is rare, occurs one in four to one in six patients. Pulmonary involvement in due course of the disease is rare, 3%, and the interoperative interval can last many, many, many years, up to more than 32 years in my own series. And we see that HPV 11 is the more severe kind of um, disease than is the HPV6 type. And we can see it here in this graph. Essentially, you see two, um, two pictures, the left one and the lower bar is indicating the age in years, zero to uh, 100 years. And on the right one, it's zero to 100 years as well. But the right one is for the HPV11 and the left one is HPV6. You see a lot of horizontal lines, that's all individual patients, and the length of the line is the follow-up of that individual patient. So if we go on the left graph to the, what is it, number six or seven from below, it's a very long follow-up of more than 30, almost 40 years of follow-up. And you see lots of vertical bars in there, and each vertical bar is one surgical intervention. So that particular patient had the first intervention at age of, well, let's say 10 years, then 15, then 20 years. Then there was a 20 year disease-free, surgery-free interval, then one intervention, and then 10 years later, there were many interventions, up to three additional ones, until the patient was somewhat like 50 years old. So this patient had a 40 year follow-up. If you compare the left side of the, the figure, that's the number of patients, so that's approximately 50 patients. And if you compare that to the HPV 11 on the right side of the, the picture, there is far less patients, but it's a more, uh, there's more interventions per, per patient. For example, the lowest one, he was, he was having more than 200 interventions in the first 20 years, then he was disease free for some 32, 35 years, and he was operated twice, once when he was like 52 years of age, and once when he was 60. And that patient is in this figure is something like 68 years old. So here you see that the number of interventions per patient is higher in the HPV 11 type. The clinical presentation is uh, concurs with that. Most studies show that HPV 11 disease is present on more locations than the HPV 6 disease. 
the younger the age of the patient, the more severe the disease, as you can see in the previous picture as well. When the patients are older on presentation, that is the highest uh, number of patients, the highest horizontal lines in uh, both sides of the picture, there are less interventions in a short time than for the young patients. Um, what we see in each and every patient is that the frequency of recurrence diminishes during the course, and that gives difficulties for, um, for calculating the effectiveness of additional treatment, because the natural course of disease also leads to a diminishing frequency um, of surgery. Um, we've performed a, um, a meta-analysis and we found no evidence that gastroesophageal reflux disease aggravates clinical course. And we do not know yet whether there is influence of asthma on the course of this disease. What we do know is that the disease leads to multiple psychosocial complaints and a higher incidence of depression, especially in Dutch patients as compared to Finnish patients. Um, we do perform the diagnosis, um, of course, with the standard flexible or rigid endoscopy on the outpatient, but we can use narrowband imaging as well. And that is a technique where we filter the white light into blue and green light as depicted in the figure and that's being done by just a, a touch with the button. So our common practice is that we first make a picture of the larynx as it is with a telescope with white light and all of you will see the papilloma on the posterior side of the right arytenoid and maybe even in the middle on the postcricoid side but if you now switch the button, uh, then you will immediately see additional lesions on the left arytenoid as well. And now when we return to the previous picture, indeed we see those two additional lesions which are depicted clearly with the, um, with the narrow band imaging. So our practice is that in general anesthesia, we perform the first impact inspection of the complete airway without any tube in there and we do it in apnea and then we have two or three minutes time to go into the whole larynx up to the uh, trachea and the carina and we can see all lesions. We take biopsies and we send in the biopsies for normal histology and for PCR on HPV as well. Treatment, well, that's not new. You can use the cold instruments, which are depicted here. We can use the micro debrider, and that is very effective in, um, in huge, huge uh, disease, in bulky uh, disease. And we can use the carbon dioxide laser. We should not use this carbon dioxide laser on the evaporation mode, but on excision. So use it as a surgical tool to grab the tissue with a cold instrument and to excise it using the laser. And of course, in the outpatient clinic, we can use the KTP laser as well. When we first had the laser, uh, we started it using it in each and every patient, which is depicted by the uh, continuous line in here. As of 1975, it started with 0% and in the 1990s it was like 90% where we used the carbon dioxide laser. However, we did use it in the evaporization mode by then and that might have led to auto-inoculation by, by the doctor himself. Um, in the 1990s and early 2000s, we started using the micro debrider, that's the dark dashed line, and uh, so later uh, we returned to the uh, cold knife and then some 10 to 20 percent we used the micro debrider and, the, um, and the, the laser, the carbon dioxide laser. When should we use adjuvant medical treatment? Well, we should consider it if there is more surgery than four times per year or when there's evidence of distal spread of RRP 
outside of the larynx. And what kind of adjuvant treatment are we talking about? Are we talking about bevacizumab uh, intravenously? That's a recombinant uh, monoclonal antibody to vascular endothelial growth factor. Or cydofovir in the lesion, but that leads to unclear results. We have, we think we have some 60% um, some positive results, but also we have the natural course of the disease. And we currently have the nonavalent Gardasil, and that works not only preventive, but also therapeutic. At least that's what we think, and that, was, that is what was found out in a meta-analysis last year. The Gardasil prevents two cancers and dysplastic lesions caused by HPV 6, 11, that's RRP, 16 and 18, that's the laryngeal and oropharyngeal cancer, and the cervical uh, lesions, and the 33, which causes cervical cancer as well. Gardasil also prevents two uh, genital warts caused by HPV 6 and 11. Um, we should consider that HPV as an infection is quite common. Thus, many people have antibodies and the virus can be detected, despite that, the virus can be detected in, in almost everybody. But only a fraction of the virus in patients develops dysplasia and even a smaller fraction develops full-blown pathology. So that leads to questions. Why are there these differences between individuals? Is it a host factor? Is it the interaction with the virus? And how can the virus evade the immune system? Is it that the infected cells is not being detected by the body? Is it because of the immune response is suppressed? And what is known about the local immune response? Is it composition of inflammatory, t the inflammatory cells? Is it the structure of the local tissue? Or what cells are the primary target? So we have the opportunities, and that is that we see different serotypes with different degrees of pathology. We have with this virus that epithelium of different organs are targeted, and HPV and non-HPV cancers develop at different locations. So that can lead to new insights, for example, innate lymphoid cells and checkpoint inhibition. So what is missing is a model system of infection, that is the host pathogen interaction, and that's the effect on the immune system. And that brings us to the approach that we need advances in stem, stem cell research, in co-culture models, and even in single cell sequencing. And we have promising results in that. So the clinical future developments might be in checkpoint inhibition of the anti-PDL1 antibody, maybe in the early use of adjuvants, maybe by providing Gardasil 9 to old patients. Prevention might be in a national vaccination. We should learn more on the management of tracheal and pulmonary RP, and maybe in personalized medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, I've brought to you some new insights in the RRP from the beautiful city of Amsterdam. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm now open for 